Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where you happen to be around the world. Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. This is live footage of a brown bear doing its thing, hanging out on a rock, feeding on salmon. And that's what we're here to talk about today, brown bears and salmon in Katmai. Uh, my name is Mike Pitts with explore.org. Welcome to this play-by-play -play broadcast. It's October 26, 2023. And to help us uh, learn more and understand the behavior of the brown bears and salmon that we see on the bear cams, I'm joined by my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger Felicia Jimenez. Felicia, it's great to speak with you um, once again. And uh, yeah, thanks for helping me out with this uh, late October play-by-play. -play. We usually don't have any <laughs> so late in the year. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's nice to have one so late. Um, I mean, I haven't been back in Brooks Camp. Uh, I've been home for almost a month now. And wow, it's still nice to be able to see how everything has changed. It's definitely a season of change. Uh, and there's still some, looking at this bear here, uh, there's still some insects flying around, which is a little <laughs> surprising. You would think, you know, with some of the hard frosts that they've had recently, that there wouldn't be um, any, I can't tell if those are like black flies or not that would be uh, seeking blood from the bear or maybe it's just like a, a non-biting midge or something like that that's hanging out and we can just see it due to the light. Um, but the, I think the water is definitely cold. We've been seeing this bear over the last couple of weeks hanging out on this rock frequently just as a place to rest and, and, and uh, look into the water uh, because the water is definitely getting really cold right now. We've had some frosty uh mornings uh, overall oh yeah um we were talking about this earlier before we got on but i checked the weather today and i think the high in um, brooks camp right now was 41 degrees so it's, it's really cold um we can see that with the water levels i am like, super surprised there are still insects you would think like it would get cold enough and they'd all just die off and <laughs> but it is it's really cold there. I don't, I wouldn't want to be in that water. And, you know, if it's that cold during the day at the elevation that Brooks River is at, which is not that far above sea level, you know, at the, at Knack Knack Lake at the river mouth, it's maybe only about 30 feet above sea level. It's much, much colder up on the mountains. And that's, you know, essentially where all the water uh, comes from so a lot less water flowing into the watershed right now because it's starting to freeze in the in the higher elevations and will soon be freezing at the lower elevations too so we have our main brooks falls camera and that's what we're looking at right now we also have if you're new to the bear cams the falls low camera which is nearly in the same position just gives us a different perspective on the waterfall itself this one is located at a bear's eye view of the water uh, unfortunately we don't have the riffles or cats river view available to us not enough battery power for those cameras today uh, but we do have the dumpling camera uh, which is located up on top of dumpling mountain where it's well it's uh, exposed to the sun so uh, bright sunny day is going to charge those batteries that bodes pretty well for us uh, often um, the dumpling mountain cam at this time of the year is like the pinch point if um, if we don't have power for the dumpling system then the signal for the rest of the bear camps can't get out of Brooks Camp. And also in King Salmon, where the park headquarters is located, this is about 30 miles away from Brooks River. We have the Knack Knack River Cam that's live. I'm not sure if we'll go to this camera or not, but it just kind of depends on what we're going to be talking about uh, during the broadcast today. Because it is live, we have some, uh, some clips to try to look at. And uh, try to answer some audience uh, questions um, as well. I know that like I always assume that there are people joining for the first time and thanks to everybody who is tuning in and watching today. But if you're new to the bear camps, let's take a look at Brooks River where that is located at. It's about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And Brooks Falls is located about at the river's halfway point. And in this view, it flows, uh, the river flows from left to right. And along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is either sent directly to a, a satellite internet connection or it's sent off of a, a couple of radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain. One of those is where the Dumpling Mountain cam happens to be located. And then those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon about 30 miles away. And again, that's also where we have our Knack Knack River camera. 
real quick, uh, just looking at uh, the cameras that we have available to us today, basically it is uh, right now just Brooks Falls on the river itself. So this will be the line of sight that we have. Brooks Falls uh, camera is located where the star is and then the area that's outlined in yellow that happens to be uh, the Brooks Falls cams line of sight. And then the Falls Low camera is, is located uh, almost right below that. We're gonna, like I mentioned before, we're gonna try to answer some audience questions that were submitted in advance. Felicia and I won't have the opportunity to look at the comments as they're coming in live. But um, if you have questions for any of our live broadcasts on the Bear Cams, you can submit them through Ask Your Bear Cam Question. If you're watching on Explore.org, you can find that in the featured comment. If you're watching somewhere else, uh, maybe you can ask a moderator, for example, if you're watching on YouTube, where to find the link to that Google form. Let's get back to the, um, to the river though, Felicia, right now. And I think what we've been seeing um, on the bear cams has been, yeah, a lot of bears that seem to be kind of sleepy, but they're also still quite hungry. Um, not a lot of fishing success up at Brooks Falls that I have noticed. And we can see several bears downstream of the falls camera right now uh, fishing, including I think maybe a mother and cub uh, or a family group that's way down, mm -hmm. uh, down river. Yeah, it looks like one of the bears um, separate from the family group has a fish. So that's good for that bear. But it definitely looks like a family group way at the back. I can't tell who that is from this far. But um, yeah, not much luck up top. And it might be uh, number 708, Amelia, and her three spring cubs. She's been um, a mother bear that we've been seeing a lot in the vicinity of the falls. She's been taking her cubs to the falls frequently. She's been fishing there. She's a, a pretty excellent angler. Um, her cubs have shown you know, a bit of independence over the last several weeks. As you can see right now, Amelia on the left and then um, two of her three cubs on the right um, moving around and not sticking very close uh, to mom. One of Amelia's defining behavioral traits is standing on her hind legs for long periods of time like she's doing right now. And she'll even take a few steps in that position. Uh, so that's one of the ways that I'm able to identify, and identify her even at a distance. Of course, she's not the only bear that stands on their hind leg or on her hind legs. They'll all do that. Um, but she does it quite frequently um, from what I have, I have observed. I don't know if you've noticed that either, uh, Felicia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, honestly, I love the walking bear. Some bears are just walking bears. Like they like to walk on both both um, two feet. Um, 708 does that. 94 is also a walking bear. I, <laughs> it kind of cracks me up when I see her just like walk around like that. <laughs> and again, salmon aren't migrating uh, through the river anymore. There are still salmon available to the bears, but not as many as what we found last month. At this time, there are far more salmon spawning. Uh, the remainder of the salmon that are here are just late spawning fish and they're dying. And, and as, they, as they spawn and die, their, their uh, bodies drift downstream to the slower moving areas of the river. So Amelia, being an experienced bear, she's, I think she's been around since like 2002 or something like that. Uh, so she she knows the river very well. She knows how to make a living here. She's raised several litters of cubs on the river. So she knows where to go at the right time of the year uh, to find a salmon. And she looks much, much better than what she did a few weeks ago when she first came back in the fall. She was looking quite skinny uh, for mm -hmm. that time of the year, but has certainly put on um, quite a bit of weight since that time and her cubs actually we were talking about this i think before the broadcast felicia how how good her cubs look um for for this time of the year yeah yeah they all look really good um and you know they've stuck around and they've been around on the cams um while some other bears have moved off and it's paid off for this little family um the cubs are looking so good so fluffy and yeah even though 708 doesn't have much of a big belly yet um she is like worlds away from what she looked like when she showed up, um, you know, in September. And another bear walking in front of 708 right now. We've been seeing several bears in this area right uh, uh, throughout the day. So I'm not exactly sure 
which one that might be. But if we get a better look, we'll try to identify it if we happen to know. Identifying bears can be difficult, especially if you're new to doing it. So if you're like, oh, how can you tell, Mike, it's just a bunch of pixels? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I struggle with the same things um, in, the, in the, same, the same difficulties. Uh, the, the bear that's running through the water, Felicia, um, isn't actually as close to that cub, I think, as maybe mm -hmm. the camera's perspective made us think yeah. there. And you could see that the cub really didn't seem to react with alarm, even though that other bear was much bigger than it. And it, and it did look quite close. But like, um, from my perspective, it didn't look, or it looked close, but we know in actuality that they probably were separated um, by a significant distance. Yeah, the cams can distort distance when we're looking at this angle, when we look at it straight away. Um, yeah, it looks a lot closer than it actually is, but the cub didn't even really look up, honestly. So that bear was probably a good, like, you know, 100 yards away or something like that, like probably pretty far. Yeah, forced perspective can really alter our perceptions on what bears are close to one another or what the bears are, are close to. And uh, this this is a first year cub. So if you're wondering, uh, 708 Amelia has um, a, a litter of first year cubs. These cubs are coming up on, you know, their ninth, ninth nine month or 10 month birthday. Right now they're all born in the den in midwinter, usually around right around the end of January, early February is I think um, a good, you know, date to assume that bear cubs, all bear cubs are being born and all bear cubs in Katmai and all bears in Katmai have around the same of a birthday. So these are first year cubs. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll see another family with older cubs, but there's going to be a significant difference in size. Those, those first year cubs though, Felicia, we talk about it frequently, how they look small, but at this time of the year, they could easily be 70 or 80 pounds. Yeah, they chunk up so fast. Um, it's one of my favorite things about spring cubs is, you know, they're born in the den, um, only about a pound, the size of a soup can, and then they're probably like 70, 80 pounds right now. Um, and then even the spring cubs that are single bears, they don't have any siblings, they're probably even bigger than that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a dramatic transformation in their first year. Yeah, they grow proportionally more than any other class of bear um yearling bears won't grow that fast they won't you know uh grow from one pound to 70 pounds yearling bears can easily double their weight across the uh the course of the summer but proportionally that's not as much weight compared to spring cubs which are only about one pound at birth and uh, again at this time of the year they could easily be 70 pounds or or more and and Speaking of Amelia and her cubs, we did get a great view of them taking advantage of an opportunity. Um, you know, we talk about cubs learning from mothers. Um, they are very keen to pay attention to what mother is doing, what she's eating. Uh, they remember really for the rest of their lives, many of the foods that are nutritious and healthy for them to eat through their experience um, with, with mother. And I think, uh, Felicia, let's pull up a clip here of a situation I think that would have uh, freaked cubs out at the beginning of summer when they didn't have experience around salmon or things like bald eagles. But uh, at this time of the year, with more experience and knowledge, um, they, they quickly were able to take advantage of a, a missed opportunity by a bald eagle. So bald eagle came down, tried to get a sockeye salmon, missed it, but <laughs> pushed it just into the shallows just enough for one of 708's cubs to grab. And of course, there's a bit of sibling rivalry going on here as well, because um, <laughs> that one cub wants that whole fish just to itself. <laughs> and we have a different perspective of this as well, but let me uh, replay this one more time. So the, yeah, the bald eagle came in and missed. And I love how the cubs immediately were like, oh, that's a fish. Because mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, when you watch, when you watch cubs, uh, when they first arrive at Brooks River early in summer, those first year cubs, Felicia, they, they are often very timid. Um, they want to be right next to mom. They um, really never leave her side. 
Um, and they, so if they see a fish in mom's mouth for the first time, it kind of freaks them out a little bit, but that's not the case here, obviously. Uh, and it's a big fish too. Good job, babies. Yeah, so that's a sockeye salmon uh, that, that cub pulled out of the water. You can see it has uh, largely a red body, green head. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not fighting uh, really over the fish. I mean, that one that, that one cub with the fish is guarding it, obviously, but they're not fighting over the salmon. Um, they're not biting each other, or scratching one another, clawing one another. That indicates that they're pretty well fed um, overall to me. Yeah, and they look good. Like, if you look at all the siblings, too, they're all of a good size, and they are all, like, much much different than what they looked like earlier um you know even in yeah earlier in the fall um but that's a that was that was such a good opportunity for them to take advantage of they moved on it quick too um and, oh, good signs good job babies yeah it was really no hesitation there uh, one of the things that might challenge them in these situations is that they don't have their full complement of teeth yet they have their canines they have um some molars but they don't have all of their teeth. Um, of course, they're not, they're, their bite strength just isn't where an adult bear's bite strength is. Of course, they're, they're, they're so young, they don't have the, the size um, to have, you know, as much strength as, as a larger bear. So for them, you know, even biting into a fish like this and pulling it apart might be mm -hmm. a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I would suspect though, also Felicia, since this cub, you know, that has the fish right now, the one on the left, that was the one that originally grabbed it, it's guarding it from its siblings, isn't, you know, sharing any of the pieces at this moment in time. And you can see that other cub with its head down, just sort of like staring at it <laughs> practically. I would imagine that the cub with the fish is probably, probably has established itself as, you know, maybe the more dominant cub in the litter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of the, the other two siblings, they have their heads lowered and they are like slow to approach. They're giving the other the other cub space. And meanwhile, this poor salmon is just like alive and <laughs> in a cub's mouth. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, let's I not forget about the plight of the salmon. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, would have, I would wish at that point if I were the salmon, like, can, can you just give me to an adult so we can end this now? But <laughs> these babies are just going to take forever. <laughs> Yeah, so so good for them, um, getting getting that male taking advantage of opportunity, but it also showcases competition um, within the litter. So certainly, as we head back to live footage, um, Amelia is still fishing downstream. She's the one that just came into the sunlight, kind of back towards the the far bank, and another bear fishing in her vicinity as well. You know, we we t we talk about competition among the adult bears at the river, but it certainly occurs within um, litter mates. Oh, let's um let's head up the Dumpling Mountain real quick here, Felicia, because we're getting some significant haze toward the east, and I think this is volcanic oh. ash blowing out of the the Valley of Ten Thousand Smokes. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like it. It must be pretty windy. Um, that's something that happened quite a bit this summer. Actually, we got several like wind storms, and you could see this haze over the top, um, and. You know, the first time I had seen this haze, I'd never, I thought my first instinct was like, oh, this is wildfire smoke, um, especially like living in California. But um, no, this is, this is ash straight from the valley. Like there's just so much and the wind is so powerful. It picks up this ash. And it, when you're at Brooks Camp, sometimes you don't even seem to notice it. Like it can just be like this real fine haze in the air, but you'll end up you know, finding like this really fine, gritty dust on everything. And it basically is just silica. Um, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes is a volcanic landscape. We can't see it from the Dumpling Mountain Cam. And unfortunately, I don't have any photos of it uh, to share, but it's a unique landscape on, on the face of the earth. Um, it's basically a valley that was filled in with ash and pumice during the 1912 uh, volcanic eruption of Nova, Nova Rupta volcano. 
uh, and there's hardly any vegetation growing on it. So when you get these really cold, dry conditions, um, there's nothing to hold really much of the ash in place. So uh, those strong east winds can pick it up and blow it um, into the Brooks Camp area. It's just, yeah, it's just a really fine, gritty dust. Um, sometimes you'll wonder why your eyes are feeling irritated. Um, mm -hmm. If you're out in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in these conditions, it is extraordinarily unpleasant. I've been unfortunate enough to experience that you know, a few times. I don't know if that's been your experience when you've been out there, Felicia. Um, yeah, uh, actually, it was one of the one of one fact that like I was shocked to learn um, because like I time my valley trips when there's good weather, but obviously we can't always be 100 percent right. Um, and there was one day where it was pretty windy. It wasn't a wind storm, but it was like, I don't know, 15 mile, 13 to 15 mile per hour winds like as you're hiking. Um, and I was like winded and tired. And so I was like trying not to breathe through my mouth very often. But after I had gotten back um, of a whole day of hiking in that, I came back like laying in my tent that night. And I'm like, oh my God, why does my throat hurt? And my lungs hurt so bad. And it's because of all of that silica and that ash in the air. It's essentially like microscopic shards of glass that work its way into your windpipe. Um, so you have to be very careful when you're out in that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people will actually bring um, like dust masks or something. You know, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, since we, you know, just just lived through a, a pandemic, many of us are, are used to having masks. And, it, you know, if you're thinking about going into the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in the future, it might not be a bad idea to bring one along with you just in case you happen to be out there in the wind picks up and starts blowing ash and um, through through the air in the in the worst conditions it actually can pick up whole pieces of pumice <laughs> but in, under those conditions <laughs> you know you just like you don't want to be out in the valley at all you just want to leave <laughs> and i think that's um you know maybe maybe your best bet is not to try to 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 be in the middle of of um, flying pumice but just get to the sides of the valley get up into a sheltered area if you can find some vegetation somewhere um, it's not a place you're going to find a lot of bears, though, which is quite quite different from um, from Brooks River. So, yeah, Amelia is still continuing to fish and, and do her thing uh, downstream. We had previously only seen like two of her three cubs, but I think right as I cut back uh, to live footage, her third cub happened to show up. Uh, but again, showing those cubs are showing independence. Um, they're they're feeling, you know, more comfortable along the river. They're not, uh, you know, following her just everywhere that they that they would have air earlier in the summer some other bears are really good at parking their cubs leaving them on the bank and some cubs just never seem to get that message or mother never communicates it uh, to them back up at brooks falls our rock sitting bear i think the bear camp many of the bear camp viewers had uh tentatively id'd this bear is number 22 uh, and 22. Yeah, obviously gotten off the rock, going to start to walk around, maybe do some fishing. We'll see where it goes up at Brooks Falls. Some bears are still trying out some of their preferred fishing spots at Brooks Falls, like in the far pool. We know we've seen bears, you know, going into there and hanging out for a period of time. And to me, it's really interesting, Felicia, because we see bears like, um, like 856 who showed up, um, you know, a few days ago, he didn't go like into the jacuzzi like he would in June and July. If it was June and July, he would be sitting in the jacuzzi, primarily fishing there for salmon, sometimes in the far pool. It seems to me that bears know where to f fish at the falls, not just because they know that there are fish there, but they also recognize that, hey, there's a time of the year for sitting in the jacuzzi and this isn't it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, if they're going to find fish, they they won't really find them in the jacuzzi area. They're going to find them in the shallower part um, where, you know, bear or fish might have started to, you know, spawn or have their maybe late spawners. Um, but they're definitely cognizant of that. I, yeah, they change up their fishing strategy, just probably depending on the time of the year. Bears have an excellent memory, not only for where to find food, but when. 
to find food. And I think they have a memory for those very specific details of when and where to find food in a place like, you know, and they're in the vicinity of Brooks Falls. Again, yeah, it makes no sense this time of the year to stand on the lip of the falls if there are no salmon jumping. It makes no sense to sit in the jacuzzi either because there probably aren't salmon hanging out in there because they're not looking to rest maybe before they jump jump the waterfall itself. Uh, so we see bears utilizing different strategies. Moving around the river is a is something that you're going to see frequently, more frequently than sitting in place, which is um, what we'll see, you know, earlier in in the year. And eventually, looks like you can, uh, yeah, that strategy pays out, and I think that's why we see so many bears doing it, like this one here, uh, that oh, just happened yay. to see a salmon. I don't, I'm not sure if it was spawning in that vicinity or if it was, um, maybe just a, a salmon that has already finished spawning. Um, it didn't have the energy to, to swim away. Well, either way, that's good eating for the bear. Good job, bear. <laughs> we'll see the bears at this time of the year being uh, still being selective about the parts of the fish that they happen to eat. Um, but I think that the fish overall are, on average, they're, you know, if a bear's catching one right now, it's probably a fish that has already spawned. So they're, they're going to be consuming nearly all of the fish because um, the protein stores in the salmon, the fat reserves in the salmon, the things that fueled that salmon's migration into, and spawning into fresh water from the ocean, and those, those energy reserves in the fish are basically spent and hardly has any fat in it. That's not to say that bears don't gain nutrition from them. They certainly do, but it's just they're not nearly as rich in calories as they were at the beginning of summer. Yeah, I'd imagine the bear would have to eat, you know, the whole thing versus in July when they're popping off like popcorn at the falls. Um, those fish are going to have so much more, so much more muscle mass, so much more fat. And it's just the equivalent of a bear stripping a salmon of its skin in July is probably going to be about the same energy output that they're going to get um, by eating a whole fish now. Um, but I mean, they're still you know, a handful of bears here and they're still catching fish. So this is still productive for them. And we often don't have camera views so late in the season. Some Sometimes we've lost the bear cams completely at this time of the year due to just power mm -hmm. issues. You know, the weather doesn't cooperate. Snow covers the, the solar panels at the falls. The, the solar panels are located on um, a covered platform where people stage during the summertime to go out to Brooks Falls. Uh, it's really the only place that they the solar panels can be set. Um, but they're at a pretty shallow angle. So at this time of the year, you just don't have this. The sun isn't rising very hard, very far above the horizon. Um, and then since the solar panels are set sort of at a shallow angle on um, on the roof, they don't catch as much sun. You know, if you were building mm -hmm. solar panels in this location to power, let's say, a um, like a building year round, you would you would not put them where they are. Um, they're there for the bear camps, of course, because that's, you know, the choice that was hat uh, that we had um and they and they work pretty well but yeah i think we've been we've been getting pretty lucky um this year it's been it's been great to have cameras at, at the falls and hopefully we'll get you know a, a couple more sunny days in a row to power up um the camera at the lower river as well because there's a ton of bear activity probably still going on there too mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's nice to see them them out this long um like I, when I check into the cams, um, I'm always surprised that like, I'll look at 8.30, you know, my time or nine o'clock, you know, Pacific time and it's still super dark. So like the days are getting very short. Um, and, you know, right now um, in Alaska, it's 3.30 in the afternoon and we're getting this golden hour light. So the window for getting that much solar power and enough sunlight is, is definitely shrinking. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, I, and I also think sometimes too, even where I'm, where I'm living and, and located right now in Maine, I think end of October, that's basically kind of like the same amount of daylight that I'll get right now at the, as, 
at the beginning of February. So <laughs> when I'm outside, I'm like, oh, it's going to get dark pretty early. I better pay attention to that because you get so in the summertime, you get so used to having much more daylight available to you. And I bet this is also affecting the bears metabolism as well. Their, um, their hibernation physiology isn't like a switch. It's not something that turns on and off. It's something that uh, happens to where they or excuse me, where they transition into their hibernation physiology very slowly over a matter of weeks. Um, and that process has probably begun already with many of the bears. And I think it's um, often tied to you know, the, the lack of daylight or the dwindling daylight that they experience. Just shorter days, like in birds, you know, with increasing daylight in the springtime, like it triggers their, 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 um, their sex hormones and, you know, getting ready for the breeding season. Same thing happens with bears. Um, you know, at the beginning of the season, their sex hormones also start to peak uh, in, in springtime. And then at the end of the year, it's like, oh, it's, it's, <laughs> the world is telling me it's time to slow down. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's why bears are leaving. Um, and it's also probably why we're seeing so many sleepy bears. Um, yeah, they don't, you know, just one day a switch pops off in their brain and they're like, all right, time to go hibernate. Let me go dig my den. Um, it's, it's probably definitely something that they're noticing over a period of time with the, with the daylight. And if you tuned in a little bit late, thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. I'm talking about brown bears and salmon, We're looking at some live footage of brown bears and salmon at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. Hibernation season though, as we were just talking about, is fast approaching for bears in Katmai. And bear hibernation is a fascinating process that uses really the best of the bear's instincts and adaptations to help them survive. It also provokes our curiosity and it remains more than a bit mysterious from a human perspective. It's not something that people can do. And many people are interested in hibernation and about uh, the denning habits of bears and Katmai. In fact, we've gotten a lot of questions about these topics recently. So let's try to answer some of those. Uh, maybe to begin, Felicia, I think we can talk about a common question that a lot are about, and that is where do bears den? And also sort of a follow-up to that, what types of habitats in Katmai can we find bear dens? Yeah, um, well, we don't track, you know, exactly where bears den, um, you know, in Katmai, um, but we do know the type of habitat that they like. Um, and thankfully we have a lot of that. Um, bears like to choose, you know, sides of the mountains where it's very steep um, vegetated slopes with like a lot of snowpack. Um, so these are going to make really nice, like stable dens. Um, snowpack is super important um, so that they can maintain that structure of the den because I know some people are worried about like what happens if a den collapses. Um, that's why they choose these very specific habitats. Um, and we have a lot of that um, at Katmai. Um, and this photo, um, I think this is the Dumpling Mountain one, right? Yeah, this is a den I found on Dumpling Mountain. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, dens have been found on dumpling. It's perfect habitat. And it's also very close by to Brooks Falls. Um, so, uh, we have quite a bit of that in Katmai. Yeah. This is the inside of that den. Um, somewhere floating around in the internet is actually a video of me crawling into it. So you can probably find that, I think maybe on Katmai's YouTube channel, it's maybe one of the first videos I ever put on Katmai's YouTube channel when I was still working there. Um, also up on Dumpling Mountain, just to give you, like Felicia was talking about, uh, really well vegetated steep slopes. There's a couple of dark spots in the middle. Those are also bear dens um, up on on Dumpling Mountain. And uh, you know, one of the prevailing mysteries of the bear cam experience is that we don't know where any of the current Brooks River bears make their mm -hmm. dens. So you know, we see bears like number 22 here, wandering around at the river. And it's, I think it's obvious or not obvious, excuse me, but um, it's something that you would, you know, I'm not surprised that people ask about, like where do mm -hmm. they these bears go? And we don't know, but we have some mm -hmm. um, inf information from personal observations 
in one tracking study that provides us with uh, some clues. So let me pull up an image here. So this is uh, an image that I annotated from uh, Google Earth. Uh, and the stars represent uh, den sites that were either located in a tracking study of Brooks River bears in the 1970s, or they're places where I have personally seen bear dens. Uh, and the closest den sites to Brooks River are on Dumpling Mountain. So, you know, when we were looking at the Dumpling Mountain camera, that's maybe like two straight line miles at most from Brooks Falls. And bears can get there into that habitat in, you know, a few hours of walking or less. Uh, so those are bear dens that I have seen. The farthest mm -hmm. that a bear from Brooks River was determined to den was a bear in the late 1970s that traveled about 40 miles east from Brooks River. That's the yellow star on the very right side of this image. Um, but it's important to to note that, and, and don't assume that these are the only places that bears go to Denning and Katmai. You know, you heard Felicia say that Denning habitat is is abundant throughout um, throughout the river, or, or excuse me, throughout the throughout the park. So, you know, what we see on this map here, those stars, that's only a few places where we know that bears have gone in the in the past. Uh, denning habitat is, is virtually everywhere. All a bear has to do when it's ready to hibernate is find a mountain and walk uphill. Uh, so the dens that we find in the park, they're, they're refuges for bears. It's where a mother bear gives birth and where all bears find safe. When the weather is fierce, food is nowhere to be found. And uh, there's, of course, much more to discuss about this, though. So maybe let's transition back to uh, live footage from the falls and uh, try to answer some audience questions about denning and hibernation that I have uh, queued up here. Does that sound all right to you, Felicia? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm actually just remembering something um, from sure. May. Um, I remember um, it, I was in the valley, um, actually with, with a bunch of coworkers, so a bunch of rangers, we went up to um, the Valley Visitor Center for the first time of the season. Um, there was still a ton of snowpack on the mountains. This is like, er, uh, probably like late May, um, still snowpack. The road hadn't been open. Um, the camp hadn't been open yet, um, but we went out there. And one of my coworkers, um, Ranger Keith actually pulled out the spotting scope um, and aimed it towards um, one of the mountains in the buttress range. And he saw this trail coming out of it. So he followed it. Um, and it was a bear when we saw a bear out in the valley um, in the buttress range in this snow covered mountain. Um, and we kind of just followed it with the spotting scope and then it kind of disappeared behind some vegetation. But we assumed that was probably a denning site. Like this bear was probably hanging out near its, near its den, but it was like the perfect denning habitat, very steep vegetated slope. Um, on the buttress range with a ton of snowpack and it just had a very clear trail that it was going back and forth from um, right with this perfect denning habitat. It was really cool to see. Yeah, and I, it, out there, there's really not spruce like what you're gonna find on this image from mm -hmm. Dumpling Mountain. You can see a few spruce trees in there, but it's gonna be like on those slopes of the buttress range, a, some very grassy areas uh, mm -hmm. and that's always you've probably experienced it too, Felicia, trying to like walk through that in the middle of summer. It's like <laughs> swimming through grass. I mean, the grass is taller than us. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's like, it's just great, great conditions for bears to dig a den. You have that much sod on top with, you know, all the roots. It's going to hold, it's going to stabilize the den structure pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be, that would be a perfect, perfect spot. Um, there's, there the grass is usually taller than me. Um, I summited buttress um, later in the um, later in September was probably one of my last trips out to the valley before it got too cold. And um, the whole all of the grass is like way taller than me. There were several moments where I was like with friends and we're hiking up and I got lost in it and I'm like, I need to carry a flag that I just hold over my head so that you don't lose me <laughs> because the grass is so tall, but it would make, it makes perfect, um, you know, denning habitat for bears. And one of the, one of the questions that uh, has popped into um, the spreadsheet where I get your audience questions recently has been about the 
the reuse of bear dens. Somebody was wondering, do bears reuse their dens from past years? Uh, in certain habitats, yes. In Katmai, as I understand it, Felicia, mm -hmm. that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I understand too. Um, because, you know, in some habitats, other places, bears like will go into caves. We don't have that. Um, and so it's kind of a habitat where bears need to dig a new den each year um, because of things like potential den collapse, um, especially with like the freezing um, and, you know, the thawing and then refreezing and the thawing and refreezing of the ground. Um, it's just going to be a lot better for bears to dig a new den versus reusing a, a you know, a den that might have some of that, you know, thaw and refreeze. Yeah, and that, uh, if I can, let me bring up that photo of the bear den that we always use up on Dumpling Mountain. Because I went back to this this site um, a few years after I found it, and I could I could find no trace of it. Um, so you would think like these holes in the earth would last longer than they do, but they they really don't. I mean, after they collapse, I mean the vegetation, um, the seed bank that's in the soil, that stuff gets covered up pretty quickly. So um, yeah. I think I think den collapse isn't something that bears have to worry about during the season that mm -hmm. they're using the den, but they couldn't probably return to that um, that specific den uh, in 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 the future just because it, it's not stable enough across um, multiple years. Uh, but we, you know, people also wonder about specific bears. Um, I understand um, this person wrote in. I understand we know we have no idea where the bears specifically den. But Otis came back looking terrible, and he was quite skinny at the beginning of the year, and he seemed like he came a long way. Would that make him den closer this year, or do they always den in the same place? Uh, as far as I know, Felicia, there's not, there haven't been any tracking studies in Katmai that have determined sort of like site fidelity with, with dens. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I know of. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if bears pick, you know, the same general area to, to make a den, you know, because they learn them um, and they, they, they're creatures of habit. Um, but we just, we don't really have any evidence to back that up. So I really don't know. Yeah, it's, I think with Katmai, it's, it's, it's an open question if they come back to the mm -hmm. same, same den. I, I have read some studies from Kodiak Island, which is near Katmai. It's offshore, of course. The bears are separate populations. But on Kodiak Island, bears seem to have some fidelity towards their denning areas. It's not like they're going back to like the same exact hillside, but they're in the same vicinity, often within like a kilometer or so. Uh, and maybe that's a, a place that they were introduced to with their mothers. And that's the reason why they're coming back um, to that area. I don't think, you know, getting back to this person's question, you know, I don't know if Otis would necessarily den closer to Brooks River just because he was, you know, kind of skinny at the beginning of this year. He probably knows, hey, if I go to this other place, that's where I've denned in the past. I've done it for like, you know, probably 25 years on my own. It's worked for me since uh, um, since then. And so I'm just going to try it again. I think they, they probably do have like a fidelity towards a denning area, but it would be really fascinating to know that specifically for bears and cat mice. We don't, we don't know that, however. Um, what about the, the, time, the, the time of the year, Felicia? Somebody was wondering, are most bears digging their dens now? And this question just came in a few days ago. So when they talk about now, they're mm -hmm. like the end of October. Or do they take breaks while digging to fish for a while? Um, I mean, I would think that some bears are starting to dig their dens now um, towards late, you know, late October is the early side of it, um, especially with how little daylight they're getting. Um, we know that moms and cubs will go into the den a little bit earlier. Um, single bears, like male, like big males might take a little longer to take advantage of food that's still available. Um, so I would think that some bears are starting to go now. Um, but as far as I, as far as I know, they take about a week to dig their dens. Um, maybe they might take a, a minute to fish, but I think that they are really solely focused on digging this den. And by the time they're at their denning site and they're starting to prepare that den, at this time of the year, like their metabolism is going to be much slower than active levels. So it's going to, the, the bear has the physical ability to dig a den within a matter of hours if it's motivated to do so. 
But when your metabolism is, is as low as it is when a bear is going into its den, it hasn't, the metabolism hasn't bottomed out yet, but it's much reduced compared to summertime. You're just not going to have the energy that, uh, that you would earlier in the year. So you, you don't have, um, you know, maybe the endurance to dig a den all in one go. So yeah, they're going to take a while to do it maybe over, um, you know, several days and, uh, whether, you know, whether they take breaks to fish, um, you know, I, I don't, since the denning habitat usually isn't located like close to Brooks mm -hmm. river, you know, in that, like that near vicinity, I would say like, if a, probably not, you know, unless a bear is digging like right into the side of the hill <laughs> that we see behind, mm -hmm. um, this smaller bear. Uh, right here, but again, it's it's part of the unknowns. Um, some some of the bears in Katmai are probably getting really close to going into their dens right now. So some could be, um, most probably are still out uh, wandering across the landscape. And then um, another question is about uh, if a bear is in a den and another bear wants that den, do they force them out? How might that work? And I, I think maybe the, the way we can think about the ans answering this question, Felicia, is like just thinking about how widespread denning habitat is in the park. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that that map was great um, in seeing where bears den. Um, but also, you know, with the exception of when they're fishing, bears are solitary animals. Um, they might run into each other every now and then, but the only reason why we're seeing them in these large numbers like this is because the food source is here. So once they have made up their mind and they're like not interested in fishing um, at this really nice, great food source, they, they're chill with being on their own. So um, I don't really expect that, you know, um, bears are going to fight each other for denning habitat just because there is so much around um, and they, they want to be by themselves and sleep. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, the denning habitat is just so widespread in Katmai that there's no need for a bear to compete with another bear for for a denning site. So they're probably, you know, there's a lot of bear dens uh, pockmarking the, the park, but, you know, probably none that are generally close uh, to one another, unless it's like a test den. You know, sometimes bears will dig a den in, in an area where they think um, they might want to hibernate and they'll be like, yeah, no, this um, just doesn't feel right to me. They might move nearby. Uh, and, and finish uh, finish a, a den that they actually will use for uh, the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else was wondering about like the instincts associated with with bear denning, mm -hmm. um, and how how do bears who are recently separated from their mothers know how and when to begin digging their dens? As I understand it, it's it's based on you know maybe some learning experience through you know a, a cub watching its mom going to those. Um, to those places, um, but it's also, you know, unconscious instincts, hormonal triggers that are telling them, hey, mm -hmm. it's time, literally time for me to dig a den, but um, I have this, just this urge to dig a hole into the earth. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, wow, I really want to dig a hole for some reason. Um, <laughs> that's probably what bears are going through. Um, and those instincts are so strong. I'm, I'm sure definitely, for sure, I agree with maybe a little bit of some, some um, learning from mom, but it's, it's, that, it's that drive, it's that instinct. And what about uh, the, the timing of bears going into the den? Uh, you know, because not all bears go into the den at once, and there, there are patterns um, to, like, if you're a certain type of bear, you're going to go into a den later than other bears so uh, somebody was wondering about pregnant bears do pregnant bears hibernate sooner than other bears mm -hmm. um i'm not sure they they probably might um just considering that um maybe they're getting that signal a little bit sooner um but i think it might also depend on the individual bear maybe the bear um you know she's pregnant um, she has those substantial fat reserves that has allowed that embryo to implant, but um, also those, you know, might not be getting those signals immediately um, and want to take advantage of some food resources. Um, but I would figure that it's a pretty safe bet that pregnant females would go into the den a little bit earlier in that earlier wave. Yeah, I think that's the case too. So, you know, they're going to be, you know, among the first bears to begin hibernating. Uh, and then it's the adult males on average that 
are out of the den the longest. So they, mm -hmm. it makes sense. They have the shortest, adult males have the shortest denning period on average of all different types of bears. Um, so they might, you know, not go into the dens until some of them not, might not even start hibernating until December and they might come out in March mm -hmm. while a pregnant female, she goes into the den pretty early. Like she could maybe, you know, some of them are starting to do that now, if, for instance, Felicia, because they have to, they use mm -hmm. the den as a place where they can gestate their, their cubs to term. Um, and then they're staying in the den until like mm -hmm. May, which is really remarkable. Think about going, you know, six months without food and after you give birth, you're nursing your cubs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they need to stay in longer because they have, you know, babies. Um, and, you know, the longer you stay in, the more those cubs have as to grow um, and maybe be able to walk on their own four little feet. Um, then if they were to come out in March, um, they would be incredibly tiny, teeny tiny. And maybe one more denning and hibernation question um, that we'll answer before we could maybe talk about the live footage and maybe one more clip that I want to show um, or, or one more aspect of Katmai that I want to talk about before we conclude the broadcast today. But we can't ignore what bears are doing inside of the den. They're just not in there sleeping. They're doing some pretty remarkable things. Uh, but what are they doing with their bodily waste, Felicia? Somebody was wondering, do bears pee and poop in, uh, during hibernation? What are they doing? What do they do? Where do they do it? Yeah, you know, as as um, this is a great question because they don't. <laughs> they do not <laughs> pee or poop in, in the den. Um, and, you know, it might be a little gross to think about, but I think it's super cool <laughs> um, because bears don't pee or poop. You know, they don't use the bathroom at all. Um, their bodies actually form a fecal plug, so they physically cannot um, urinate or defecate in the den. Um, and it's so important because they're, you know, they're not eating or drinking. Um, and so their bodies have to pull out as much moisture as possible from their fat to give them, um, you know, to give to them. So they don't have any excess to, to like get rid of. Um, so that's, that's a super fun fact. Um, bears bodies are super cool and their kidneys are amazing. Um, so I love that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, they, if, if people were doing that, um, if our kidneys were shut down to the point that they are in, in hibernating bears, you know, we, we would die because we would, um, you know, we, we would die of essentially metabolic poisons in our bloodstream. Um, bears don't have to worry about that when they're hibernating. So they're not urinating, they're not defecating, they're recycling their bodily waste and their digestive tract, importantly, is, is um, empty at that time of the year. So they're not really producing you know, things necessarily that they would, uh, in, the, in the quantities that they would need to essentially evacuate, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they're, they're, they're not eating. But um, yeah, but they're still doing amazing things. They're still producing some bodily waste. Much of that is recycled back into like usable protein to help keep their muscles healthy. And, you know, they're recycling water to keep themselves hydrated. So that's one of the amazing, remarkable things about brown bears, no peeing or pooping during hibernation. Uh, they're they're just a, a self-contained system. Really, all they need from the environment at that time of the year is oxygen. Really amazing uh, to to consider. Um, Katmai is such a special place, though, Felicia. Um, we get to see you know the bears fishing at Brooks River. We get to see other wildlife, it, and, and Katmai itself is a, is a wildlife rich area. It's one of the largest national parks in the United States, um, and it's also a place where people are discovering new things about animals all the time um, through careful observation. In fact, recently there was a paper that was just published in the journal um, Ecology about wolves on the Katmai Coast. And this is um, an open access article. So it's free for everybody to read. There's no paywall there, thankfully for that. Um, but yeah, just Google the title wolves on the Katmai Coast hunt sea otters and harbor seals if you want to read that. Um, because they found a uh, some pretty interesting uh, interactions between wolves and marine animals on, on the coast of the park. Yeah, this is such a cool study. Um, I am so happy that like Kelsey published her paper. Um, 
it sheds some light on um, what's going on in the coast. Um, if you were to tell me a few years ago that wolves hunt and kill seals, I would not believe you. Um, and then this clip that Mike is showing is um, what is described in the paper of a wolf hunting and eating a seal. Yeah, and this is not um, this is not all of it. I'm just kind of looping it uh, because I think the paper described Felicia that this this hunt went on mm -hmm. for quite a long time, and it was a single wolf basically that took down a harbor seal. Yeah, um, pretty brutal what's described in the paper, but I mean scientifically that's really really cool. Um, I never would have thought like seals and um, sea otters are woven into that food web um, that that wolves are consuming. You know, I think about wolves hunting um, like ungulate prey, like really big, you know, caribou or moose, but um, seeing bears like or bears, seeing wolves take down um, seals and sea otters is super, super cool. Yeah. And and I think people are surprised sometimes to see wolves, you know, like at Brooks River fishing near the bears. Mm -hmm. Like this one, I think this clip is from 2020. We had a wolf or more than one wolf visiting the falls frequently that summer to catch, uh, to catch salmon at the falls. I remember, you know, maybe like 10 years ago or something like that, posting on the internet a footage of a bear or excuse me, of a wolf uh, catching salmon at, Brooks Falls and people seem to be very surprised by that phenomenon because because we it's, uh, have labeled wolves as these these hunters of big animals like caribou like moose like deer but they take advantage of situations just like the bears do and in a variety of prey so I think marine resources are uh, particularly important for wolves in coastal areas of of Alaska and especially in, really anywhere on the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, for a bear that's living sort of like in the um, the interior of Katmai, like the wolves that we see at Brooks Falls, and this is more bear cam footage, uh, you know, salmon are going to be really important for them, uh, for, for those wolves on the coast. Again, it's going to be maybe salmon and sea, uh, sea otters and harbor seals like we see here. So yeah, really kind of amazing stuff. I, I you know, every year I, I wonder what people are observing out in the park and it's probably some really incredible um in incredible uh, sights mm -hmm. yeah and honestly that's just really good signs for cat mice ecosystems um especially with the fact that um wolves are hunting sea otters right um and getting them at large numbers um you know we know that the sea otter population on the pacific coast um, took a really big hit because of the fur trade um and you know now the sea otter populations are protected on Katmai's coast so to the fact that they have rebounded enough to where they are back to a vital chunk of that food web um and you know wolves are using them as a food source like that like that means their numbers are high enough to sustain that um, so that's a really good sign that we see. Yeah, Katmai is a special place in so many ways. Um, and I feel fortunate to be able to share this place with everybody every day on the bear cams here on Explore.org and through our partnership with the National Park Service. Um, so, you know, good luck to uh, all of the bears and wolves and all the other creatures in Katmai. I know it can be, um, you know, life in the wild is tough, it's difficult. It's often, um, you know, painful for them, but, you know, they're survivors. You know, the bears that we see on the cameras right now are, are in, in the salmon, especially, they're examples of success in a really tough and competitive environment. Like this bear here, I think this is bear 903, a young adult male who is uh, getting pretty pudgy and he could be one of the big dudes mm. at the falls in the future. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to have a play-by-play -play next week. It really depends on bear activity and, you know, and whether we have access to the cameras because it can be a little iffy at this time of the year. But uh, Felicia, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your day to, to, uh, to join us for this late October play-by-play. -play. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so glad we could have a later one. Yay.
And my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-host today has been Katmai National Park Ranger Felicia Jimenez. Uh, and until we talk to you again, please enjoy the bears and uh, share your experience with other people. You don't know what you're going to see or discover on the bear cams. We learn a lot from the observations of our bear cam audience. So have a great day, everybody. Enjoy the bears. And as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning. <laughs>